Cool. Okay. So welcome to the Legal Hacks call, the LexDAO Friday Legal Hacks call. Uh, I'm going to lead it today. Uh, Ross and um, Jordan and some other people are doing some other projects. So can anyone not see my screen? Can everyone see my screen? Looks good. Great. Okay. So keep in mind, I am learning along with a lot of you. I am not a professional programmer. I am not a professional smart contract developer. I am none of those things. I do have a decent background in programming, so I'm now starting from nothing. So don't think that I'm just some sort of genius who picks this up very fast. I do a basic background in programming does help a lot. I was actually talking to a friend recently who is like a full computer science degree or a master's or whatever he has. And he was saying that smart contracts is one of the first times he actually really values that because there's some really intense concepts. But the basics he also was saying was were pretty simple. So for me, like I do get a little bit of a head start because I understand data structures and loops and all those kinds of basic things. Um, but again, but this is just the caveat of like, if you ask me too hard of a question, I will not know the answer, but I will try to answer. So with that said, I'm just gonna talk through some of my basic process and then we'll talk about upgradable contracts. I will try to go slow, uh, slow me down because I talk too fast in many cases, and but I'm, I would love to walk you guys through it and definitely have this be more interactive if possible. Questions so far? Cool. Okay. So some of this is going to be just my process for learning. I've been learning this stuff for a decent amount of years, and so I just want to share some of my practices. They may not be best practices, how I've learned to code over the years. So you can see here, I am in, this is my massive Google Doc. Let's see how many pages this is. This is 108 pages of years of programming notes. And so what I realized soon after starting to program is that I so often found a great link or a great something, and I could never find it again. So I started logging what I was learning, and it's been super, super helpful. I refer to this document once every few days, I know I learned that thing about regular expressions or Git years ago, and I could Google it, which I do sometimes, but this log really, really helps just a huge amount. So I can't recommend enough logging as you learn. It can really be helpful as you go. So you'll see here, this is my upgradable contracts log that I started last week when I started to learn about upgradable contracts, and when I found good links, I just put them here. So this is my collection. Obviously, there's other ways to store them, but this just happens to be how I collect my stuff. And uh, so yeah, just a little on how I've been learning the things. So let's just jump into some of the um, process for some of this. So I'll start with just basics of upgradable contracts. And some of this will be basic, some may get a little advanced. But for the most part, when you put a contract on the blockchain, you, you can't change the logic. The contract is not going to change. So if you're in remixes, we've seen Ross and Jordan and a lot of other people use very often. If you're in Remix and you put one of these contracts on the blockchain, for the most part, you can't change this data. This data will live here, you cannot change it. You can change what is contained in the variable. So when you set a variable, like a, you know, like a price for something, or a struct like we've talked about, any one of these in here, those you can change. Those you can add more of, those you can delete, those you can do things with because they're variables. They're they're mini databases on the blockchain. But if you when you save onto the blockchain, all these other libraries, the contract, the contract name, all the other functions in here, uh, you can't change that. This function is going to live on the blockchain forever. So the concept is that some people realized that they they did want to change some of that stuff. They didn't want to launch a contract to a, to a certain address on the blockchain and have it never be changeable. And so what they did is that they used, it's a combination of contracts. They end up using a contract. And in essence, what that does is that it will be the parent contract with the address that will never change. That will be what you always refer to as this is where the contract lives. But what it does is it points to an implementation contract. And that implementation contract is what you can actually change. And so what you would do is you would take that proxy and you would just point it to different implementation contracts over time. So you V1, you launch it, you create a contract, you deploy that contract, the, the main contract, the parent contract, the proxy contract to the blockchain. That will be a main one that lives there forever. You separately deploy at least one other contract that the proxy parent points to. At that point, you've got a working contract, a working 
um, proxy and implementation contract. Then, as it goes on, let's say you, you want to add some functions, you want to change something, you deploy a new implementation contract, a child, I'll call them parent and child here, but it's called the proxy is the parent and the implementation is the, the child. You deploy a new child contract and you point the parent implementation contract, a parent proxy contract to that new contract. So what that enables is that you're not changing the parent. The parent's always there. You always have the same address of it. The data is persist, so you can keep that same mini database of, of whatever it is, your structs, your, your variables, or whatever you have. And you can then just keep going with your time. So you may you add a function later, you forgot a, a change of functionality, you can add that, and it's still the data persists and the parent contract persists. I'll pause for one question and I'll start showing some demos in a second, but any questions on that so far? Is this sort of what Uniswap has done with their V2 and V3 implementation? So thank you for already asking a question I don't know the answer to. My guess would be no. My guess would be those are actually just completely different contracts because I think they probably run slightly as opposed to like a new version. But if someone else knows, someone should jump in. Yeah, that, that's right, Jared. They're, they're entirely separate uh, contracts. And they're, they're really a set of contracts. And I think, I, I know V1 was maybe like two or three. V2 is like six to eight or, or, or something. And V3 is, is much more sophisticated. Cool. Thanks, Eric. And that, the reason that was my guess is that when you're, if you do start looking at upgrading contracts, you can't upgrade that much. You can, yes, add some functions and move some things, but you can't really change order of variables. You, it's just not as powerful as, as to Eric's point. Uniswap changes, like these are fundamental changes in how the contracts work in the protocol, in the pricing mechanisms. I, it'd be much harder to do that. And you would need a reason for that. For Uniswap, they can just have separate contracts that run separately and in parallel. This is if you want to uh, persist the data and you want to still have the same parent contract that it points to. So that's so you have to have a reason that you want to upgrade. Otherwise, just launch another contract. It's much easier and cleaner. But you have to have a real reason, like, here's why I want to upgrade and not launch a new one. Uniswap just launched completely new protocols, which like lots of new things. So I'd say that one probably was, again, that was why it was my guess that it wasn't uh, an upgrade. Any other questions? Are there, are there specific permissions uh, required to change the pointer to the child contract? Yes, completely. So you can, you can do it in different ways. Uh, so for most, con or so by, I should say by default, it depends on how you deploy, but by default, only the owner, only the deployer of the contract will be able to upgrade. You can build in permissions. The same way you've seen a lot of the coding if you join these calls, you can build in, it's pretty flexible language, so you can build in other a whitelist or other permissions in the contract that can let other addresses do things. You can even can partner with multi-sigs to do certain things because you do want to, and I'm sure this is the question you're getting at, it's obviously a risky thing to do to upgrade a contract. You can completely point it code base. That's obviously a high-risk thing, and we see hacks all the time. So the answer is yes, you build whatever permissions you want. Generally what I've seen is that you have an owner who does it, but I have also seen that there are multi-sig capabilities or you can give it to more than one person or you can transfer ownership. So the answer is yes, you, it is definitely a permission thing that you want to be very careful about. There, hey Jared, there is another yeah, way that, that we can do it. If you don't want to mess around within the Solidity contract, that's a way, that's a reason that those ENS names are very valuable. So if you've got like a parent ENS like abc.eth, that abc.eth can be mapped to a specific smart contract. So if you trust the parent, you're going to trust them to point to the smart contracts that they think are appropriate for whatever, you know, annual or quarterly or when there's a bug fix or something like that. So that's how that would work. That way you can keep your smart contracts and what gets deprecated, it just stays out there, but you start pointing to the new one, but you don't, you only do that with an ENS. That's really cool. Hope that makes sense to you guys. Yeah, that's really cool. Cool. Any other questions or thoughts? Great. Okay, so let's look at one. So here you'll see in my screen, I have some links to a, so I'm not an expert in this stuff. In some cases, I've seen it deploy three contracts when I do the initial deploy, some cases two. But no matter what, you have this parent, and no matter what, you have an implementation. And then afterwards, when you upgrade, you have more implementations. And so what I'm going to do first is let's look at, so this is on Polygon. This is the parent, the proxy, the parent or proxy contract. 
and you'll see in this one, so you can see right away, so I'll start with the transactions. So this is, just like any contract you've deployed, looks very similar to any other contract, right? So far, so good, transactions, whatever. If you go to the contract, and then, and I already did it here, because you can see these other buttons here that usually in here, you go to more, more options, you can tell it it's a proxy. Once you tell it it's a proxy, you'll see these buttons pop up that allows the block explorer to interact with the implementation because it knows what to do. These are not, it, it, it's the combination of the contracts that make this all work together. So if you were just reading or writing this contract, it would not work. If we were just reading or writing the child implementation contract, it also would not work. You can only do it by reading and writing from the proxy parent contract, and then it will act as a combination and let you do exactly what you would do as if, if you do use a block explorer, you may, this may look familiar to you, but then it'll work the same way as if you're interacting with just one simple contract. So it is nice that it still does these things. But that's the combination, the parent proxy and the child implementation. And so let's just look at some code for a minute. So for a lot of this stuff, oh, well, we, don't, we use Remix a lot in these calls because it's super simple. It's in the browser and it's really quick to do some of the stuff. For some of these things, it gets harder to use Remix as it gets more complicated. It's harder to share code on Remix. It's harder to deploy um, proxy contracts with implementation. You can do it. I've been actually researching a little bit. It seems like you have to deploy contracts separately twice and then do some manipulation. A lot of the libraries you have when you're deploying um, and working locally are going to be made to make this stuff work. So it's much easier in some cases to do this stuff locally. Just something to keep in mind. So I have my here my local environment. I'm using something called Hardhat, which is just a, a library of code that's pre-written to make this stuff easier. I have my Open Zeppelin libraries and all this stuff. And so this is the a current product, this is a live contract that is upgradable. So this is what it looks like live. So first I'm just gonna talk through, so this is called, so I don't know how far, how basic to get, but this is called GitHub. So Git, Git is a technology used to, it's really called for version control, it's also for really sharing code, but it's a way to track changes in code over time and collaborate on a project. A lot like for lawyers in this call, it's not so different from tracking changes when you're redlining documents. And you can actually see that here, right? There's things that are added, things that are taken away. And so what you do is you, I take code locally, I edit the code, I can do changes. I can then show someone just the rote work I've done. I can show someone a compact document, or I can still view the main document. So Git really is a technology that it is a lot like redlining, a lot like then having, you have your original version, your redline, and your clean version. Sometimes when you're negotiating a deal, you'll see those different versions coming back and forth. So Git is like that for coding. So if you look here, this is my Git um, update for when I converted the contract from a non-upgradable contract to an upgrade. So you'll see here the changes, the red will be things I took out, and the green and blue things I put in. So I'm going to walk through line by line and we can talk through it. I'll pause for one second just to make sure everything's keeping up. Any questions? Hey, anything? Hey, hey, Jared. So you had an unupgradable contract and then you did upgrade it to an upgradable one or was it it hadn't been um, deployed yet? Yep. So you, that's a, that's a vital question. You cannot upgrade a contract that you did not build to be upgradable. If you don't okay, deploy the first version in an upgradable format, it'll be too late. You have to deploy a new version. Got it. So this is, we're looking at your we're looking at your changes to um, the contract. Uh, these are your I don't know how to describe it. Your your local code that is not deployed that you're changing. So yes, I know. So the, the red. So what I did, and this goes back to the Uniswap question before. What I did is I had a contract that I deployed. Then I said, you know what? I keep wanting to make changes. I need to make this upgradable. So if in the future I need to change something, I can do that. I I just forgot about the first contract. I, obviously, as we talked about, you can't delete it from the blockchain. But I was like, okay, I'm done with it. I'm never going to use it again. I then changed the code and deployed a new contract to a new address that is now upgradable. So to the point of this, the red is the first contract that still lives on the blockchain. The green is the new upgradable one that I deployed separately that I will now upgrade when I next make an upgrade. I'm with you, thanks. Cool. 
so so a lot of the stuff, and you'll see uh, it can seem like a lot of changes. It's actually very few changes. It was surprising how once I understood it. To be fair, like I spent some time in forums, I asked some questions, I was super confused for a while about why I was deploying so many contracts and what they were relating to each other and how they were pointing to each other. But once I got the basics, it was it's actually really straightforward. In large part because what we're talking about because of hard hat and open Zeppelin, these these frameworks, this pre written code that people give to you that you then just build upon. So when I'm writing a, when I'm writing code in here, ninety percent of the code that I'm using, I'm not writing. I'm just relying on and maybe even higher actually, maybe even ninety five. I'm just relying on other libraries from Open Zeppelin or from Hard Hat that are giving me the code I'm using and the framework I'm using. So it makes my life much easier. It's the same thing as if you've heard of like Ruby on Rails or or React or all those things. Those are not those are like higher level programming languages. Underneath there, there are lots of other lower level interactions with the computer. You're just doing like some really simple stuff that is super empowering because some much better engineer somewhere built the whole framework for you. So this is the same concept. So you'll see, number one, all I did, and I didn't have to upgrade Solidity, I just happened to do it at this moment. But number one is for all these libraries that I had, I just chose the upgradable version. So you'll see it's all the same libraries, just with the word upgradable at the end. So all that is is that the code was going to allow itself to be upgraded. So a nice simple one, just different libraries. As I mentioned, libraries are just other, just pre-written code that I'm using from someone else to supplement the code that I'm using. Makes it much easier. So, because a lot of the stuff is, is is template stuff, right? I don't need to rewrite a new ERC seven twenty one code. I just want to use this, the basic stuff and pick out the stuff I need. It can be a little inefficient. Like if you were a superstar coder, you probably are writing some of the stuff by yourself just because this stuff will have extra things you won't use, or you may think you have a better way to do something. And so you may want to do it. For me, I'm, I'm not that level. And I don't need that. So I just grab the library and I rely on it and I use what I need. It maybe gas fees a little bit higher than I want. Maybe it's a little less efficient. But for my needs, that, that's more than enough. For for Uniswap, I'm sure they're writing almost everything from scratch. Um, well, at least even they probably they still have probably some like fundamental libraries that they don't change, like some like fundamental math or data libraries, because there's no reason to write some of the stuff. But a lot of it they're probably writing themselves. You can even go look at the contract probably and see what they're doing. So that's number one, changing the libraries. From there, for all these new libraries, they just need new names. So I'm just now inheriting all the code that I just talked about into my contract. This stuff didn't even change much except for same thing, right? From counters to counters upgradable. From counters to counters upgradable. So still the same thing, just picking up new libraries. This stuff is also, this stuff actually didn't even change. It's, it's like this line. Oh, actually, sorry, I'm sorry I did. So one thing that you have to change, so when you're using an upgradable contract, you can't put as many variables in the this outer section. You actually have to put them in the initialize script or initialize function because if you want the variables and the data to go with you when you upgrade, it has to be structured a certain way. The structure function, which you see right here, that's what runs when you initialize a contract. When you first deploy a contract, the function runs. It does whatever you tell it to do. That runs only on the initial deploy. So you can't use that because you need one that's going to run again and again and again when you deploy new versions, when you upgrade. So you actually have to you leave this blank and call the initializer, and this is the function you use. So then Solidity won't just look for the construction and run it. It will actually run this when it needs to. So you can control it in different ways, and it, it will it'll be upgradable. And so related to that, before I had this price in the outer section, now I just have the I initialize the variable there, but I actually set it in here so that I can run every time I I deploy a new contract. So related to that, these are just initializing. You have to initialize when you launch a new contract, when you're, when you're initially launching any new contract. There are certain scripts that run through your parent and then through all the other libraries may have scripts that have to run. So this is just me saying, hey, proxy contract, hey, new deployment, you run these again. Because usually they wouldn't run again because they only run when you first create the contract and that's not what I'm doing here. Here I'm actually, I am creating a new implementation but not a new proxy. But this is just saying, hey, run those scripts again. I'm, I'm deploying a new contract. I'm going to do certain things. I need these to be new also. So some of these things didn't change much. As I mentioned, the constructor is still there, but I, I don't do anything in it. I added some pause functions, not related to upgrading, so you can ignore the contract if I wanted to. 
these are these are actually again minor changes. In fact, I, these aren't even doing anything. I just was testing. If you want to know why I did this, it's because I wanted to test the upgrade. So I just changed the contract in the simplest way I could to see how it looked on after I deployed it. And so that 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 worked well. And one thing I learned is that I kept trying to upgrade the contract without changing anything, and it was not working. It wasn't upgrading. So I think that's probably a hard hack character that if it finds out the contract's the same, you haven't changed anything, it may not upgrade. So keep that in mind if you do this and you want to test it, you may actually have to change something. Um, also could have been like, I'm also probably making mistakes as I go, so I'm learning, but that seemed like what was happening. Continuing strings to strings upgrade, well, as you see, like it's, it's almost all library upgrades. That is the main thing by far, library upgrades and really the constructor to initialize. So those are the two big changes. All these are the same things, the same thing, ERC721 to upgradable, to upgradable, that, that's every one of these changes. So super simple. Again, the, the, the concepts are important to understand before you do it, but it's actually a really simple thing to do to convert it. So it's almost all library changes, and, and it, it took me a little time to understand this in the constructor, and, and I'm still not an expert at it, but I, I got the basics. And to obviously to move this, and, and things broke, right? I would, I would deploy it, and it would break, and I'd, I'd run some tests, and it would break, and I'd figure it out. But that's the basics. One of the related changes that is actually the more fundamental change of how this works, I had to add a library. As I mentioned, this was a, an upgrades library that, hard, that I got from Hardhat. But one of the other ones that, so you'll see often when we're in Remix and we're deploying something, so we're, we're going through this process, right? Here's my code. I compile it, so I convert it to code that the computer can read more easily because the computer doesn't read English. I then go to here and I deploy. I can deploy to one of these local test environments. Or not even local, I guess they're on the internet, so it's not local, but it's not, it's not a production blockchain. Or I can deploy to Injected Web3, which would then go to an actual blockchain, whether it's a test like RinkB or Kovan, or Coven, however you say that, or it's actual mainnet, or it's Matic, or it's Solana, or it's Arbitrum or Optimism. So here, that's what you do. You just choose it, that pops up, you choose the contract, and you click deploy, and that deploys for you. So in some ways, and this is why, again, like people like Ross use it, it's super, Remix is just super convenient. Is, is great error messaging. There's a lot of really good things about it. But sometimes it is, and so, sometimes it's just personal preference. Sometimes it's easy to do stuff here. And upgradable contracts is one of those things because if you look here in the code changes, so if you were doing that through Remix, you couldn't just deploy the implementation or the proxy. You have to deploy both of them. And then my understanding is you have to then point them to each other somehow. They may know, but it's a little more complicated. And then to upgrade, it's a little more complicated again. Unlike locally, where the scripts and code are already written to make it much easier. So if we look at right here, so here's my deploy script. The deploy script here is essentially essentially doing the same thing that when I click deploy here. It's sending the code to the blockchain. So right here, right here. Pretty simple though. All I did was change the, so I had to change a little bit of how the variables work. But I really just had to change this deploy to deploy proxy and just pass the con. And so what that will now do, instead of deploying just the one contract, this will deploy the two or three contracts at the same time and point the proxy to the implementation. It will then return the proxy, the parent, because that's the one I care about. That's the main contract, the one that will never change, the address that is mined for my contract, the one I will refer to when I'm minting, when I'm interacting on in Block Explorer, or even Remix. No matter what you're doing, you would you still always go to the parent, to the proxy company. So I also changed the, the library. I had to use the upgrades library. So that's one other thing I had to use. But really, it's just, that's it. In this entire deploy script, I just changed this one part. Related to that, I had to have a new upgrade script. So you can't, you don't just then deploy the next time. You upgrade. It's still a very simple script. You can see it's really short. But I have to pass it the proxy address, the address of the parent contract the name of the new contract I'm upgrading with, and then it looks a lot like this, grabbing some libraries, and I'm then just running this upgrade proxy function. I'm passing it the address of the proxy contract, and I'm passing this other contract that, I, um, that I'm pulling, the, the code that I'm pulling that I wrote locally. And then it's going through the same process. It's now, what I mentioned before, it's going to deploy a new implementation trial contract, and it's going to tell the parent contract, hey, Point now to this new implementation, forget about the old one, but keep the data. All these logging statements 
are just printing. So when I go to my console right here and I type my code to deploy, those are just there so that they will print statements here so I can make sure it's working properly. So upgrade, it'll say upgraded contract. Then it will say upgraded contract address, this. Then it'll say the name and so on. This is just in, for if it, it errors out, we'll catch the error and tell me the error. So as you can see, there are certainly complicated concepts, but it doesn't take a lot of code. And it's not that hard to do most of the stuff, in large part because of all the pre-written libraries. So again, I'm going to pause for a second because I know I've been talking a lot uh, and talk, take questions or feedback or other, other um, ideas or other points. So the main purpose of this is to, to drag the data that was collected on the older um, smart contract to this newer implementation. Is that the is that the main reason for it? So yeah, so it depends on why you're doing it. So the answer is yes, that's one very big reason. But keep in mind, you could actually pull a data yourself and recreate it yourself. So there are other ways. If they, if your only goal were that, you you could pull it from the block. You probably have it stored locally because you're you're minting. You could pull it from the blockchain. So there are other ways to do it. So I'd say that is one of the big ones. In my mind, and, and, from, and actually my use case specifically, I more cared about not changing the address of the parent because I wanted that link not to break. I wanted to, everyone to know in the world, hey, when you get, you know, I'm using for the creds that we use for LexDAO, I wanted everyone to know in the world when, when anyone relies on me, when OpenSea relies on me, when anyone who's going to use my data relies on me, they don't need to keep taking a new contract address. So for me, it was actually more about that. And obviously these things go together because underlying it is really just the data. But I didn't want them to have to change the parent address. So it's nice that they go together and that okay. makes sense, but, but they're related points. I, I would say they probably both go together in many cases. Which, which helps for kind of what I was thinking, that if you can have an e, a domain name pointing to the parent, that would never even have to change because you already have your proxy upgrades built into that parent 0x address. Yeah, that's a great point for sure. Okay, okay got it. I'm actually going to write a note to myself to see if I can just use like in cred or like cred.eth as my and never have to worry about where the other, the other stuff. Well, we have, um, don't we have, we have lexdow.eth and we can put as many subdomains on that as we want also. So let's say that there was one that you wanted to experiment with. It could just be cred.lexdow.eth and we already have that within lexdow. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. That's great. Questions, other thoughts? With the proxy relationships, parent-child contract, um, is it just the child contract that is actually changing the code and the parent contract is consistent? You're triggering a function to point to a new contract? Am, am I understanding that right? Yeah, that's basically it. The parent, so to the point before, you can't change the, the most of the code of the blockchain, right? You can change the data structures, but you can change the functions. So you're you're just you're just ditching the old one, putting a new one out there, and pointing to it from the proxy parent. So yeah, that's correct. Cool. So let me see. There's other stuff. That's most of it. I'm happy to talk through more stuff. But I think that's most of okay. what I wanted to. Sorry, sorry. Someone say something? Yeah, sorry about the super noisy truck in the background. Um, yep. How would, and maybe Scott is helpful with this question too, how would using a .eth address stop um, the contract address from changing? Yeah, Scott, I think I understand what you're saying, but you want to jump in? Oh, with, with ENS, it's just a faith like that because you know the the person in charge of the dot eth domains they could change that but you'd have to change you'd have to trust that person it's like if you're a huge company and you can verify that that huge company owns that dot eth any subdomain would fall under that domain and you're not having to verify the long hash of a contract because remember that's where you can get tripped up because a contract has like what like 64 characters in there so somebody could theoretically trick you and say no 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 that's the real contract but with a parent what he has on the screen right now. It allows you to manage that name and everywhere it points to. And these are very feature rich now. Down in here, if you go into the text records, they have all, look at all that right on the screen right there. You can put, you can map right. all that to .eth now. Right, so I think the point is kind of like DNS, if you know, if you understand like how the, the regular internet works, the DNS stuff works in that, I think, and Scott, if I'm wrong, but 
the point is you always use, so I own this, I own this ETH domain, right? Incred.eth. You can say, hey, everyone, always point to ETH, incred.eth. But what I can actually do then is point incred.eth to different addresses. So it's kind of like a back-ended way to then say, always point incred.eth. Instead, of, I don't have to upgrade the contract. I can actually deploy a new contract, change the address this points to, and you're still pointing to incred.eth. I think that's what Scott's saying. But you even get more than that because now with you that own that incred, you get every uh, subdomain. It. So all you have to do is append the front with another subdomain. So you could, you know, either just name your contracts and just say this is the, you know, the the initial cred contract dot in cred dot eth. So so Jared has all that ability to append to the front as many domains as he wants. It could be thousands if he wants. But now you trust that the contract would be called contract number one dot cred dot eth. You following me? And then on each of those subdomains, yeah. he has all this functionality that he has on the screen to map that to send it to a domain, apply it to a Discord address, whatever you want to put in there. You can put text records in there, which if you know how those work within domains, you can use those for verification purposes because nobody else could have put that text record in there but Jared. So we can now use it for not only efficiency, but also reliability that if Jared says it's true and it is appended to his .eth name, it must be correct. Because we trust Jared, or we trust Cred, Cred Donnie. Super helpful, thanks. Cool. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is this is just an ENS record, so you can see to all this, the stuff Scott is saying. And if you don't have one, it's not super cheap these days. I think this cost me a hundred bucks to set up, but it probably does make sense to play with it because it, it's a good education just of seeing how it works. And I can point to things and set up all these, as Scott was saying, like the text records and all this. It's, it's pretty cool stuff that you can play with and learn from. So, and unfortunately, unfortunately, they were really cheap. It's like I was part of those discussions. We made them like each, but gas just, you know, you'll pay $5 per year, but the gas is like $75 to get it. So that's right. where that system's broken. Fucking ETH again. Right, right, right. The, the, the cost is in the gas, not even in the registration. Although, depend, I think they also, if you do try to register a like one or two or three level letter domain, I don't know if they do one. Uh, those do get more expensive. They were trying to discourage people and make them more valuable to certain people. So they took it more expensive. Oh, oh that is true. Six five letters or, or more. Yeah, yeah, I tried to stay at five. Pretty cheap. Maybe six or more. Yeah. Do the domains work on layer twos yet, like Polygon, or is that not ready? Uh, uh, absolutely. Tried it. Yeah. yeah, because it's the same one. So you just have to make sure whatever chain you're on uses the same, um, ha what, whatever algorithm Ether uses. So yeah, I, I map like my ETH addresses, like Regency.eth, it picks it up. I'm pretty sure on Arbitrum too, like Arbitrum, Polygon, Ether. Polygon has no idea. I'm, I'm sorry, um, Polkadot has no idea. So that doesn't work there. And I don't deal with like Solana and any of those. But as long as it uses the same 0x address, it should be able to pick it up. So you can see here. So I just went to Etherscan. I searched for my ENS name. And it took me to the right place. So let's go to Arbiscan. Let's see if this works. It didn't work here. So maybe it may not be hooked up. Okay, I think I'm wrong on that. Can you try um, Polygon Scan? Or is no. that the one you just did? Nope, nope. I can try that. I also registered it today, so it, it may be, I wonder, it maybe it takes time, although I'm not, I'm not sure it makes sense, but maybe it does. Yeah, maybe it does. I, I would have to go check. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, though. It's You can ask Google. I'm not sure, but, well, look at the price of ETH. That's good news. But but at the basic level, it, those addresses are cross those chains. So if I'm looking at my, like, you have that, right, Jared? Like, if you put in your 0x address in all those chains... Yeah, right, yes. It yeah. works. It, it yeah. will connect to your guy. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know if ENS is actually just so strict that they only want it to be on Ethereum. It would make sense because they are called <laughs> ENS domains and .eth, so maybe they have something against ARB and Polygon using it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And do you guys have any experience uh, integrating the unstoppable domain? Do they work just the same as domains, or are there any you know, differences that uh, builders should be aware of? I don't even know what that is. I don't know what's an unstoppable domain. So there are these domains that um, they sell that have different abbreviations at the end. I understand 
they work with um, Ethereum network. I, the ones I bought actually, well, yeah, I was able to onto Polygon, and they're getting pretty big now uh, as far as like being pretty reputable in the industry. Yeah, but that's all the ending dot crypto dot wallet. I think the dot X is uh, a fairly uh, popular one, and you can just type in a word. And you can see the price for all the different. Interesting. You can see the price for all the different. Yeah. So they definitely charge more, which kind of sucks. But uh, they seem to be getting pretty reputable in the space. And uh, so, is this a private company that owns these extensions that is selling them and then redirecting them however they want? I don't fully understand it. That's part of why I asked. But my understanding is that they purchased some sort of rights that is connected to the ethereum main net and so that's how they resolve to similarly that a dot eth resolves but i, I don't know all the details and I, i'm still wanting to learn more but uh it seems they've been getting pretty popular yeah i don't know if someone else knows i don't, don't know a lot about this stuff i'd be surprised if they could if they, if they have special treatment from the ethereum Somehow. No, it's it, it, it's separate. Um, and since uh, since I got a long time ago, I never really had a reason to try to like ex like experiment with the other ones. Unstoppable domains was just too expensive for me to get to in get involved there. And the other one was IPFS also tried their own domain because remember IPFS and Ethereum were two different sort of things, but they've really like started to join forces in a lot of ways. And IPFS sort of deprecated what they were trying to do to ENS and those kind of work together. So unstoppable domains, I think it's just like a, a different sort of web three ready, but I can't really speak to exactly what would be the benefit there. except maybe picking up some, some really neat names, but the price tag's pretty heavy. Yeah. And I don't think it has all the same functionality as ENS, though, if that was your question. Cool. Thank you. That's a good question. I'm not sure the answer. Maybe report back if you find if you find anything out. I do wonder. Um, yeah, I, I would just be, I'd wonder what's behind it. it. It seems like it is a private company that's some building tech to plug in, which maybe is great. But it, it seems less crypto native on the blockchain from ENS, but I, I could be wrong. Yeah, definitely may be my limited understanding that they had purchased these, you know, something related to Ethereum, and that's how they were able to resolve on the net network and work similarly. But uh, I'll definitely look into it. Cool. Did someone else unmute? I thought I saw someone else or heard. Yeah, I mean, I use I, for what's worth, I use unstoppable domains for uh, the on the Polygon network, uh, and it's pretty cheap. I get. Uh, NFT domains for 20 bucks uh, and it's right now it feels a lot more like a GoDaddy service than a web3 product mm -hmm. like like ENS but it does certainly work for you know you can you can point contracts to it for sure so um, so so you map so you map so similar to ENS you kind of like take the domain or the subdomain and you can point it to like a web3 asset yeah, either a smart contract or a website or something yeah, it doesn't have that dashboard. It's not nearly as refined as ENS right now, at least from what I've seen. But it has, you can link up a product to it. You can put Fleek into it or whatever and host domains at uh, those products. Well, one feature it sounds like is you can use it on Polygon Arbitrum because it looks like when Jared checked, his domain should have shown up on those other chains. And so that would be a feature if it. Yeah. Or just type Lex Dow in there. See, it does anything show? I just, I just did. Yeah, I just you did. did not. Oh, okay. And I, I think there's some nuances too, where certain browsers only resolve certain addresses right now. So I think like the Brave web browser. Yeah, uh, works with, thing, actually. yeah they work with the uh, ETH domains, but they were not yet working with the Polygon unstoppable domains, but I had heard that that was coming. Um, so there's definitely some nuances there and, and it's evolving. Yeah, for me, this is what it keeps doing. I don't know if I, it said I have to set up maybe in Cloudflare, but it keeps directing me to the ENS page for some reason, not to where for, if we're redirecting somewhere.
It doesn't. Cool. It doesn't look like it's redirecting. No, I said yeah, it wasn't working. I don't know. I actually, I was just playing this this morning. No, it's not even see. set. I didn't even see in there that anywhere it was set to go. To, anywhere in that page does it go to the co-op? It uh, would show up that page you're looking yeah, at. No, I did, yeah, I didn't see oh. that either. No URL. Yeah, so it's just not. Either. Let's see, Tesla. So it takes me cool. there. Oh, no one even, does no one own that? I know someone owns it, but it's not set up. I don't even have one in their mind that would be set up for sure. Ethereum. Maybe 10 Fenny. There we go. So Ethereum.org. So even this one, so let's see if I go to Ethereum. Yeah. Yeah, so this one's okay. So if it's set up, maybe it does work on to the point of Brave. So I'm in Brave browser. And they just uh, link to an IPFS hash right up there. Yeah, right. They're, yeah. So they're just running the web website on IPFS. Yep, yep. Yeah, so these people are advanced, as you might expect. It's interesting, too, that on Unstoppable, none of the WAX domains are available. So I don't know if they're protecting us or... Uh, or how, how, why that is, but interesting. That is which ones? Which ones aren't available? On it, uh, none it of them. They're mostly protected. And I, I, I wonder if they only let you register. No, that wouldn't make sense, I guess. I was going to say, I wonder if they only let you register stuff that's not registered on ENS because they're using. That was just a complete guess, but I, I, I definitely don't know the answer. I don't think so. I've definitely seen duplicates, but I guess what I'm seeing now with the like wax.dao, which is kind of a cool domain, it says protected, reserved brands, notable individual trademark owners. So I definitely appreciate that they uh, you know, do that. Yep. Cool. Any other stuff from anyone? Good conversation. I appreciate the thoughts and the feedback. Do you have any resources that you really uh enjoyed learning me i've kind of started to dabble in a bit and i you know have previous uh, software engineering skills but you wanted to get deeper into smart contracts so are there any courses resources other things that uh you know you would uh, point us to yeah the best ones that i've liked so far are build space is a good one this um uh, get over here Build space and also the guy, the um, this guy's name, YouTube, the chain link guy. If you know him, the P is it Peter or Patrick? Patrick C something, Patrick, Patrick Collins. Collins. Yeah, so the three things that I found most helpful so far are build space, they have a bunch of really good classes on there and really like hands on. You use Remix, you use Replit, and so it's a lot of like building in the browser, really easy to use. Patrick Collins who I think is the chain link, he's a chain link guy, he's like the, their developer advocate or whatever that, that that title is. But you'll find if you search for him, he has a lot of really good videos. And Solidity by example is just a really easy place to just march through these one by one. It actually doesn't take that long and read the code and try it in, in Remix and play with it. Those are the three that I found most helpful. I have other people, anyone else have good resources? I know Eric, Eric's on the call. Eric also made a great list. Yeah, and Eric's repo for his 100 Days of Solidity has got some good ones. I know 100 Days, uh, I know that the Solidity by Example is in there. Um, I, I think that I actually found that those Crypto Zombies was quite useful, although now that I'm doing more, I've realized that they're not doing things super efficiently and things are getting done differently. But for the process of like building out line by line a, a contract, I found it really useful because I have no previous coding experience. So that was a different starting point. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll dump, I'll dump these four links. You can see here's Eric's. There's a bunch of stuff in there. Tutorial right here. Tutorials on the stuff they used. So I'll dump this. This one. I'll find... I, he has a couple of really good videos. So he actually has one in upgradable contracts too. But his stuff is always really good. So I'll put a few of those in the chat. And I'll put this in the chat. So I'll bring up those few. And Jared, since we watch you and we kind of like know what you work on, uh, when did you start coding? Was it years ago? Or did you just pick this up fairly recently? Or? Solidity I'm new to. But coding, I, yeah, I started... I've never been, I came close. I, I've never been a professional coder. I'm just someone who loves the code and my, my brain works like that. So at this point, probably 10 years ago, I started doing a little bit and just, I just moved slowly over the 10 year period because I never did a full time. So every time I wanted to play with something or build something or heard about new tech, I would just build something little and learn about it. So I, I guess that's, I definitely have some of a basis. Um, and it does help. Like I do, I actually have, I can share this also. Like, were you doing like websites or were you 
back end stuff or a little bit of everything, just whatever, like a little bit of, at the time. Yeah, a little of everything. I'll share these links also. <clears throat> so this one, you'll see it here. Um, this one actually has a bunch of good links. If you were looking, it depends how much time you have, what, what your goal is. I found it super helpful to go through. I didn't do all these in every single detail, but I did do a bunch of these. It is really helpful, the basics, because it will walk you through like arrays and structs and data structures, databases, and JavaScript basics, which you will, you'll probably be using JavaScript a lot of this. So you don't do all these, but I'll drop this in too, and you can ask me questions about which ones are the best. It's not too many, too many things. But like in, in, these intro courses from David Malin at Harvard is, is just fantastic. He's super hands-on. So I've, over the years, like I've done all these things. So I definitely am probably just time-wise a little ahead of people. But I did find this stuff really helpful over the years, so if that's helpful, I will dump this in too. And again, it depends on what your goal is, because you can just jump into Remix and just do smart contract coding, and that may be that may be enough for you. But if you're like, actually, I kind of want to go deeper, I find it super interesting. You may want to do like just one of these computer science courses, and and then one of these JavaScript courses, maybe. And I, and I want to reiterate something that um, Jared said at the beginning of his talk today, which is when I started this a couple years ago, too, I started to keep, not meticulous, but I started to keep track of this long text file of all the places I'd been and all the places that I think that I learned something new, knowing that I would probably need to refer back. There's so much to learn. And if you're just clicking the Click in hyperlinks and kind of learn something and you lose where you were sometimes you need to go back and actually revisit that so you have to almost create your own indexing or your own master document and that was really helpful for me to be able to learn and not forget everything there's a and, lot. And to that point what i often do so this is a clean code base because this is in production what i often do when it's ugly or even like as i'm learning and building for the v1 before i get to like more advanced i actually write so you see these like the I'll actually often do like tons and tons of comments with links here. Like, here's a link to the, the um, like the Stack Exchange post that told me exactly how to do it. I can always get back to it and it's linked to exactly the right place in the document. So that's another way to do it, just putting in comments and right, like really, I can like pull up some old code, but you, you see my comments like it's like paragraphs of stuff of like here's how you do it, here's where I got this information, here's the mistake I made. It's a really good way to document stuff and not forget about it, especially if you're not deploying for Uniswap or for like a big company. It'll always be there. You can always learn it. And then later, if you want to delete it, you delete it. It'll still be in the Git repository. So it's another way to do it. But I, I can't, yeah, I, I agree with this. What Scott's saying is right. It's, it's just super helpful to have those notes for yourself later. Jared, which channel are you dropping that stuff in? I'll put it on in the Legal Hacks channel. Yeah, for okay. I'll, I'll dump all the links in. Yeah, I'll mention too. So this is something I've been really curious about, like whether it's, you know, can you jump straight into Solidity or is it, of, uh, you know, broader background. There's a guy doing this, uh, running the, I don't know if you guys have heard of 100 devs, but it, it's it's like a free 30-week course that runs Tuesday and Thursday nights. They've got a Discord. Um, super helpful stuff. It's like basic HTML, JavaScript, um, you know, that sort of stuff. But I'll, I'll drop the link to that Discord group also. There's a lot of helpful info in there. Awesome. Is it this thing on my screen? I can sure I can put this in the link. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Uh, Leon. Pretty. He's he's got a YouTube channel like with all the past. He, I think this is like his second year he's done it. Yeah. And um, there's some great great success stories and folks that, that you know speak to the program and everything. But he puts all the uh, prior videos on YouTube, and so you can watch that stuff there. And uh, it's it's. That's a that's a pretty good content, so I'd I'd recommend checking that out if anybody's interested. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I'll throw it in there too, and if you have the links, throw them in. Cool. Anyone else? Really a, good stuff. I have a technical question. Lots about learning things because I ran into this last night. Uh, so when I when I define and this is probably a basic question for those of you who are better on the call, but uh, I define all my variables at the outset. Then I do some basic, a function that does some basic math on the variables, adding them, multiplying them. I am not worried about uh, rounding errors or the floating point stuff because I've got a workaround for that uh, with the safe math thing that I'm learning how to use. Um, but the question is, when I generate a new answer, so I, I add A, B, and I get C, do I need to actually, if I want to refer to C in another function and use it, do I need to send that to a new, to, to memory? So I, that's a, one thing that I can continually like, am confused on when I should be sending things to memory. Like I understand how it works, 
I just don't know when I need to set it to memory and when I don't. I guess is my question. Yeah, I'm happy to give a, a quick answer, but I th this is definitely like a good question. Maybe Scott knows, or maybe, maybe Ross wants to answer, or Jordan. But so number one, I, yeah, I think what you have on the screen is perfect. Yeah. So this is I actually was just reading this the other day. I find it super interesting and, and complicated, like you, Jeff. I I can digest it, but I'm also still confused about exactly when to use what. The main point seems to be mostly about gas and where you declare variables. The ones that we talked about related to upgrading, the one are going to be in storage and are going to be take gas or more gas, I should say. The ones in the function are local to the function and will disappear when you're done running the function. So I don't know. I think when you when you s declare the variable, it's going to <coughs> somewhere. It's going to memory or call data if it's in the function. So I'm not sure about what you mean by like sending it there versus I think the root of the error that I'm getting that I posted in in in, in the chat is that the variable that's getting churned out by my map, which is like a new variable, isn't mm -hmm. set out at the beginning, is not then being stored somewhere. So then when I call it later, it's saying we don't know what you're calling. I think that's can you share that. I, 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 threw, I threw the function. I threw the function up in, up in, uh, up in the in the legal corner. Wait, sorry, which one? Is it? Which is in the channel? In the, yeah, I just threw in the legal hacks channel. Okay. So. Jeff, I think, I, well, you're describing maybe a scoping issue. I'm actually wondering, but let me just check. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say, Jeff. It sounds like an issue of scope, and uh, that's at least you know one thing that I've kind of picked up on in some of my early learnings. I'm in legal hacks. I'm not. How high up? You're in the legal oh, okay. I'm, in smart, I'm in smart contracts. I'm in smart contracts. Oh, smart contracts. Oh, sorry. Okay, one That's my bad. Does that mean when you said scope that he's trying to look for it outside of that function? Is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. Okay. So do you, guys, yeah. do, you know scope, do you guys know what scope means with that, how that works? No. Okay, so let me, I'll show you. Let me just pull up this. So scope is about where you can see a variable. So Let's just, use, in fact, you know, let's go back to this section. Like these, to do it. So let's look at this. So if you have a in here, right? You're saying my struct, my struct memory. You're declaring the variable in here, right? Yes. If you then try to access this variable outside of this function, the contract doesn't know it exists because the scope of this variable is only within. If you declare something out here, the scope is the entire contract. No matter where you call it, the whole contract will know what you're talking about. So you have to make sure that the scope is right so that if you can't yeah I don't, think that's the, I don't think that's the issue here because basically okay. i just I, i'm not i haven't even got a struct in it which may be my, also my problem because all i've got is a bunch of variables that i'm adding and multiplying together it's, it's basically just a math thing um, okay and, I, and maybe what i need to do is go back and reformat my variables to exist within a struct so that it so, can call that struct later on but i, I don't I know how that, should do be, that that shouldn't be the issue i don't think that. so you're saying well it says it says here equals total. Is total declared outside also? So there is no, that, that's what's weird. There is no function or variable called total. Oh, sorry. That's what's I, that's breaking it. You can't declare. You can't. You can't do it like that. You can't have equal. There's something wrong okay. with that. So never, that line should be number one. It should be at the beginning. So total. Total should be at the beginning. It should be total equals something, and then total needs to be declared somewhere to be defined as a variable. Okay. If you guys are following, by the way, we're in the smart contracts channel. If anyone wants to jump in, but you'll see. Yeah, I wanted to look at it. Where is it? It's yeah, in the smart contracts. I'll just put it right contract. here, and I'll put it right here in just a sure. second. So and here's, here's, oops. So here's the code that Jeff is posting. So what I'm saying is that this needs to be defined somewhere, and you have a scope role if you're using it outside. This should probably be here. Total equals whatever, and then yeah, total. I don't know where this is defined, but total should be defined somewhere as something. Sorry, total is it. defined. Total is defined at the at the what? at the outset. So total is, is defined as as an as an unsigned integer at the outset of the contract. Can you post? What, how's it defined? Can you post that row in? Sure. It's just uh, on. It, well, it's just u int total. Yep. Yeah. I'm just you're saying. Sure, you're sure, is capitalization is right and all that stuff. That, that's why I'm asking to see. Like, it, does it look exactly like this? Yes. Why? Why is it a capital T? I, so that may be an issue as well. I don't always get it. I, I understand about using some private stuff with the underscore, but the capitals don't always make sense to me. What's the what's the syntax that's best to use that, that yeah, needs so, to be used here? Maybe well, that's the issue. It, I don't. But so often it's not the issue. It's just a, it's more um, 
is more practice than the code cares. Okay. But I am just wondering if, if like there's something wrong with the punctuation or you're missing something else. So is it it's you in and it just says total there's no That's all it says. like private That's or public or anything? Because because it's a it's a it's a variable that is totally it's a sum variable. I'm taking a bunch of variables from another contract, they're gonna get inputted into it. That, that I that, that will have to be brought in by the user, and then it is gonna churn out an answer. And so the total is the answer. So all I'm saying is it's an UN, it's an unsigned integer two fifty-six. And it will be, and, and that, that's what it is. And then the, the, the issue is, is that the function that does the math, which I've laid out there, yeah. uh, is trying to determine that. And then I'm going to use that total to, to, do, to send some ETH around. Well, you're and, saying and, the total and, is, and just, by the way, I, I, um, I, I would say, let's just consider the call. People are going to say, I'm going to say this call. Sorry. Right I'll just yeah, sorry. I'm, I've just kind of consumed this thing now. I've just kind of no. It's, it's, okay. it's fun to talk about. It. It's really, but people can stay on the call or they can leave. Or someone else. By the way, if other people know the answer, they should just speak up also. But people should feel free that we can officially end the call now, unless someone has something else related to the call, and then Jeff and I can talk for a few minutes. Um, cool. Yeah. So I. This is definitely. I, I'm not the expert in this. I would definitely consider. You're saying it's declared and the data is coming in from somewhere else, but then you're doing this function. I'm confused by why the data is coming from somewhere else, and then you're also making it equal to this thing here too. It's a tax thing. I'm trying to figure okay. out some taxing issues. So yeah. there's a value that somebody's charging for a service or doing something in a contract, yeah. and there's a tax associated with that 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 doesn't get calculated in that contract. So I'm trying to build a contract that they can essentially plug into to help them resolve the tax issue. So it needs they need inputs from that original the outside contract about what some of the values are because whether you have an income of $100,000 or $1,000 changes what the tax is going to be. Then, then this function defines some of the tax rates okay. and churns out what your total taxable amount is and then moves some ETH around to accommodate that. Does that make sense? That, that's, the, so. that's, that's the net goal of the contract here is a, is a, is a tax thing. So it's okay. heavier, but it's got to bring in a lot of like, it's got, you got to set a lot of variables around tax rates and then, but also kind of like what the actual use case is, like what the fact pattern is of the actual individual at the time. Does that make sense? So, yeah. so I've got a set of variables that are like state tax or federal income tax rates. And then I've got a second set, which are, in user inputted from the sense of this is what I actually made in a year. So, so calculate the, what, what's payable. Um, that's what I'm trying to do here. And that's why that, that, that's, that's why I'm confused. And it's not so much I'm confused. I'm just confused about what the error is referring to because the error is telling me that, let me just read it again. Cause I put it in the smart contracts. Yeah. Name has to refer to a struct enum or contract. Right. So, um, what, what's the deal with the X thing that you have right there? Uh, it's just a different set of variables. So the so the so the A, B, and C are tax rates, yeah. and the X is the inputted amount from from the ink from the from an individual's like income. Let's say. So you're right? taking that as an input else. So that's being passed in. That's being passed oh, in. Correct. Correct. Okay. Jeff, why don't you screen share with us quickly so we can see what this error coming up is also just double check that the variable is in the global scope. Okay. Let me just do that. Um, one sec. Let me just steal your screen share here. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, my remix keeps freezing. I, I just wanted to paste into remix so we could try to recreate it. Uh, okay, one sec. I'm just going to put my screen up. Jared, there's no chance that you would be willing to share that back developed with some of your fellow WexDAO brethren, would you? The what side here you said the what? The Google Doc that you uh, have kind of been building. Uh, I probably can. It's not the problem for you is that it's 108 pages and only 1% solidity. Um, but I can probably. I probably I could probably put into a separate doc for you guys. It's not it's not gonna be that helpful, but the um 
the upgradable contract section, I think is the main set. Let me see how much Solidian stuff I have here. So yeah, right now, that one, the other stuff is like water for street scraping and OAuthing in and Google APIs and cron jobs and regular expressions and terminal and public private keys. Yeah. So MongoDB all- databases, Git. So yeah, this is like my sequel. This is like me learning like in over years of building all sorts of random stuff. Fair enough. I have, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've done the same thing with kind of my learnings, trying to track them and uh, almost like a, how you would prepare for a law school. It, right. Makes sense. An outline. Yep. Uh, Jeff, are you sharing or what should, should, I, should I? I'm just going to try more time to get this into a different one. Definitely sounded like a scope issue to me, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. My remix has too much stuff in it, it keeps melting. Jeff, are you still there? Oh, looks like Jeff is gone. Anyway, it, it does seem like it's something like that. It's, it seems like it's something actually pretty straightforward that, like someone who I'm sure is looking at this would just know right away what's going on. Because I'm wondering, like, do you have to, I don't know if you have to write, write memory here. I don't know if this X can, or if you have to tell it what it is. I think it can be floated. There's a default value that it's assigned. Mm-hmm. That's why I figured, let's, like, let's just see the code. Let's yeah, yeah. What we're talking in circles. Yep, you ain't a equals one. You ain't b two. You ain't c. So you can do so. This is the power of solidity and why it's so fun to use solidity and to learn fast mm-hmm. and to skip the the computer science background. It's like you can do some stuff like this. But let's just see. You int x equals ten. Does anyone in our, uh, I saw Ross was into it a little bit, but do we have any Rust developers uh, in the group? That I know of. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Uh, contract. Oh, sorry, I forgot the. Yeah, so this, this is going to be beyond my capabilities to do quickly. Jeff gets his stuff in there. We can look at it for a minute. But this actually should work. Anyway, are people, it looks like Jeff's going, so I'm not sure. I'm going to play this for a few minutes, but I'm going to jump off unless people have other questions about this stuff. Yes, yeah, see if it works for you. Yeah, okay. And you got a, you got a capital issue there. Oh, right, so, it's still there, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know to just point actually, the shadowed declarations here, eight, five. Oh, because I'm declaring um. You meant, so let me get rid of this stuff. Do I even need these things once I declare it? I wonder if he's declaring the variables twice. Oh, there he goes. Now that is the error he's getting, I think. My right? name has to refer to a struct enum. You know, name. I don't think that. Oh, was he missing them? So we actually might be. Get the rules around private and public. Function. Did Jeff have it designated as private? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it has something to do with that. Yeah. 
I can pull up my notes here. For solidity. Private function called. Name has to refer to. It's definitely reading this weirdly. I don't know if it doesn't know. I wonder if he's not calling it from somewhere else. I know it's not a function public. Um, and what about declaring those var variables at the top? What about doing what, sorry? Yeah, like, yeah, make those public. See if that fixes the error. Yeah, no. And does it need that pure keyword by chance? Because it is doing uh, some sort of math. So like after public on line 20, try to add pure. Add it right here? Yeah. How do you spell what pure? How do you spell pure? P-U-R-E. -E. Oh, pure. Yeah, it still seems like it's something there. So here we go, I'm a real error. And look at my solidity notes here. We're compiling it, obviously. Yeah, well, it, it just does it by itself, yeah. When you save, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, even though I take out the math, there's still something up with that. That's still the error then. Declare a type for the uh, function input. No, it already has a declaration that it says. U int, yeah, I don't know which one is U int A. It's funny because it seems so. It seems like this should work so. Yeah, we got to be missing something obvious. There's no reason. Yeah, I'm sure, like, again, like, our contract developer would just know exactly what's going on here. Return. Okay, so there, so I wonder if, oh, that's interesting, actually. Did you get it to work with the view? Public view returns, so there are probably several problems here, but let me just copy this thing. Let me do this one.
like I said, I think that's the problem. I think that his, his it is a scope thing. I think that actually his variables are well, they are, it doesn't need to be passed in because it's a global variable, so he can just he can just call it. I see. That's yeah, my guess. Available. Okay, okay, that makes a lot of sense. I don't know where he disappeared to, but I think that's the issue. Because when I took it out of there, so now it works. So I just want to get back to it. Let me put this whole whole thing back in here. So let's just see you. We don't have to be concerned about any impacts by adding keyword, right? Adding what? I hear what you're adding what? Um, by adding that view keyword, um, that didn't do anything for us, right? I don't just think so. I don't know what he's doing. I just wanted to return something so I could see. You can see what he's doing if he needs that. So, yeah, so it's not erroring anymore right now. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. Like, like we had suspected. It's just because we are passing the variable. Yeah, yeah. It, just, it didn't need it because it was already global. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm proud of us. <laughs> We're getting there, right? Yeah, yeah.